So today we're going to build off of the material that we covered uh, before. Here is, I'm using this um, PowerPoint. Here is sort of the goals for today's class discussion. The defining the challenge section is like really just a brief, it's just a brief review of material that's been covered over the course of several weeks. And then we're gonna define the concept of systems change and talk about some of the contemporary approaches to community development that are aiming for systems change. I'm gonna focus on two. I'm gonna focus on defining and explaining the, the use of comprehensive community initiatives. That is a very prevalent form of community development that has been in place for several decades. And then I will talk about collective impact approaches, which is more recent in terms of a formal practice, but really builds on prior community development practice and then employs a framework. And then we can have some question and answer. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, I'm fine with taking questions throughout the discussion if needed. So defining the challenge, very, very brief review. This is material that the students, I think at this point are really familiar with. So please, anyone at any point who wants to weigh in or add anything, I welcome that. So we've, over the course of the semester, have talked about the fundamental reality that where people live influences their opportunities and life outcomes. And we benefited in this class from having a combination of both planning students and public health students. So this has meaning in both disciplines and it's, it's been helpful to have discussion that links to both of those fields. What we mean by this is broadly the concept of housing quality. Where are community members living? Do they have access to quality, affordable housing stock? That is really important in terms of playing out with their day-to-day -day as, as well as long-term outcomes. If one doesn't have access to affordable housing, they risk being rent burdened or housing cost burdened, and that limits their ability to spend important and critical resources on other aspects of their life that they need to be able to fund, including food or education or healthcare. Similarly, if the housing stock is affordable, but it's not high quality or in any way, uh, or it's dilapidated or not meeting sort of basic conditions of habitability, that is also going to impose a lot of adverse um, impacts on the family or household that's living in that housing stock. So children, for example, that are exposed to lead paint face uh, outcomes that are, you know, difficult health outcomes, whether there's lead in the water, whether there are, there's pests or rats or other types of rodents in the property. These are all things that matter and shape both one's life now and, in, and at times in the future. Food access is another important element of understanding how our environment shapes shapes our life. Do we have access to healthy, affordable, quality food? Is it within a reasonable distance from where we live? Can we walk to it if we had to? Or do we have access to quality transportation to get us to that food, that source of food, or even other opportunities such as, um, I'm going to go to the next slide here, educational opportunities or economic opportunities. So do we have quality, do we have access to quality schools? Are we in close proximity to a strong job market? Are we living in a neighborhood where more people are unemployed or employed? What is the issue in terms, what are, is there good proximity to training programs? Can we get access to opportunities for economic mobility by improving our skill set, or acquiring new skills? What are the programs and opportunities that are in place and are they accessible to the residents within that place? And then there are things such as environmental health conditions, some of which I touched on in the housing context, but they can be bigger than just the house you live in. It can be in relationship to whether your neighborhood is in close proximity to, a, to an industry that is polluting your environment, or are you living too close to a freeway? Is your air quality poor because you are in close proximity to, uh, for example, you know, trucks driving by? Uh, is there an overexposure to any other kind of environmentally harmful substance? Another element that we have to consider is the built environment, just not just for environmental conditions in terms of health outcomes, but do we have access to quality open space? Do we have access to places in which we can walk comfortably outside safely? Or is there a lot of violence in the area? Are there parks? Are the parks quality parks? Are there play spaces for children? 
are there opportunities for community gardens and growing ones, you know, growing your own food and so on. These are all conditions that can influence how we live today as well as what our opportunities are for the, for the future. There's an abundance of writing around this in multiple fields, both within planning and within public health as well as sociology. And over the course of the semester, as you know, we've covered a lot of material in this. So, um, defining this challenge, I think can also be explained using this graphic that actually comes out of public health. I think it's pretty effective at sort of illustrating the relationship between the, the various factors that we discuss. Hopefully you can see my pointer. But right here we're seeing land use refers to both housing and built environment. You have housing specifically here, transportation, the element of where we live in relationship to who we live near, residential segregation, schools are over here. We also understand there are larger factors that play a role that have to do with social inequities. And the point of this graphic is to illustrate that there are multiple factors that interact with inner individual behavior that can lead to these outcomes over here. And that I think is an excellent, I'm gonna use this visualization a couple of times to explain some of the points that we're going through. But this is a great graphic to sort of define the challenge. Defining the concept, concept of systems change. So I think as a starting point, it's sort of important to understand the distinct, you know, it's distinguishable to talk about systems change versus working to change a system. So what I mean by that is the concept of working to change a system could mean work to focus primarily on reforming education or work to address climate change. But thinking about systems change is something a little bit more than that. Here's a definition that comes out of the practice literature. And what this is sort of describing is that it's connecting to all of the different policies, processes, and the relationship between these different elements and the power structures that are in place. Um, and thinking of, of making a change that creates a pathway to, to improve uh, you know, social outcomes that are sustainable. And it connects with concepts of equity, improving health, or reducing poverty, which as you know, are large social problems. But using this graphic again, I think it's actually even more helpful at explaining this concept. I think this graphic sort of illustrates the concept of a system because it explains that there are multiple factors that lead to these outcomes here. So again, I'm sort of using my pointer to describe what is described in this, this health space as downstream, right? The disease and injury impacts or the mortality outcomes with respect to infant mortality and life expectancy. But the fact is, is that the system of all of these different pieces feeds into these outcomes. And if one wants to attempt to improve these outcomes with the systems change effort, you're going to be thinking about how you can simultaneously address all of these different elements. So for example, systems change would contemplate how these multiple elements actually create an integrated whole. So you will would as a practitioner contemplate the different elements within this graphic, right? You would look at the upstream factors and the midstream factors and see how they're interrelated and you would try to work to understand how they influence each other. And then the systems change work would involve thinking about what action the, you know, the organization or the entities that are attempting this would take to impact the, just, you know, the outcomes that are here in the downstream category. But then that has to think carefully about what types of investments are actually going to shift the policy and program side of this, as well as what kinds of elements of are going to influence the physical environment and generate you know, interventions at the same time and in individual behavior, all while being mindful of these social inequities, right, to improve the outcomes related to disease, injury, and mortality. You can call this in addition to systems change work as systemic thinking. You're thinking of an outcome within its context of a larger whole to understand the relationships between the different elements like the programs, policies, social inequities, the physical environments and individual behaviors and how they interact to lead to specific outcomes like disparity in health outcomes, right? Or rates of disease. What does this really mean for a planner or a professional who's pursuing community development? Well, practically, I would argue that this involves work that's focusing on a range of interrelated elements of a problem rather than trying to narrowly define a project, right? So a contrast, sometimes it's easier to define something by saying what it's not. 
A narrowly defined project might be focusing exclusively, for example, on constructing affordable housing. But that's not what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about a planner who's intentionally trying to grapple with a really complex social problem, even if the work is located within a small geographic area, and is trying to craft solutions to the problem that really aren't gonna be readily apparent at the outset, and even the obstacles and opportunities are not gonna be obvious at the outset. They're going to emerge over time and they're probably gonna be unpredictable. So it's a very different kind of practice in that sense. All right, so next slide. Some of the you know, contemporary approaches to this sort of effort of systems change work in community development are called comprehensive community initiatives and a collective impact approach. So I'm gonna walk you through both of those. And again, I invite you to sort of ask any questions or give thoughts or feedback about anything that sounds familiar to you from your prior reading or your own research or work. So, the first one I'm going to talk about, comprehensive community initiatives. These have been around longer. These emerged uh, definitely in the 1990s and have continued since. They have some key characteristics. They're, they're definitely what we would call place-based strategies. They involve multi-issue large-scale investment into a disadvantaged community. They do require substantial community participation. So there's a lot of work that has to go into community building. They're very sort of distinguishable from earlier interventions that might have been a single intervention, like, like I mentioned before, constructing affordable housing or improving an existing affordable housing development. Or for example, saying we really need to prioritize and invest in early childhood education and childcare. Instead, these are approaches that attempt comprehensive neighborhood you know, improvements to address the complex issues of concentrated poverty, insufficient economic opportunity, poor schools, substandard housing. So you can see, it takes on a lot. And I want you to try to remember those points as I give you a couple of examples, because I'd like to sort of push some of you to sort of think critically about what you might see as potential issues within the structure of what's happened. Um, I would also say that there's a real emphasis on community capacity building. That's a term that, again, I feel can sometimes be jargon. So I'm going to just sort of define it for those that aren't familiar with it. It really just means working hard to build the capacity of local communities to develop, implement, and sustain their own solution to an identified problem. In other words, it's trying not, it's trying to avoid a top-down approach and instead really empower local residents to be able to develop a solution and sustain it to a problem that they help identify in the first place. But broadly speaking, these also uh, can have funding that come from the public sector and philanthropy and incorporate nonprofit organizations to implement strategies. And here are a couple more of, you know, that's what I just sort of explained in terms of key characteristics, in terms of who the actors are. But I think pretty important to acknowledge, although this might seem obvious, a key characteristic of Grant is that they're advancing systems change or working to do that. So some examples of past community, comprehensive community initiatives at different scales are listed on this slide. The first two are examples of strategies that were implemented through two different agencies in the federal government under the Obama administration that attempted place-based systems change work in, in the context of providing funding for planning grants and then implementation grants. And so I think this is where I would love if one or more of the students would love to go off of mute and just think critically for a moment about what some of the obvious challenges might be of a strategy that's attempting systems change that's sitting primarily in a housing specific, you know, a housing and community development traditional agency versus department of Ed education. So if you're trying to tackle concentrated poverty, insufficient economic opportunity, poor schools and sub housing, and some of that work is coming from one agency or is funded by it and some of it's coming from another, what might be some of the obvious challenges you might, you know, you might predict would occur? Anybody want to volunteer? Would one of them be that, you know, transitions between different administrations with different priorities? Uh, for example, HUD under Obama versus HUD under Trump might pose a threat to the continuity or, you know, 
even securing a funding for these programs? Absolutely. That's, that's a very important one. So, for example, if you were to go online and do some research into either of these, you're going to find information that's dated and in relationship to the Obama administration. You're not, you're not necessarily going to find uh, more current information that seems to be a continuity of those prior initiatives in the way that you just described, right? And that's going to become relevant for a later part of this discussion. And that, does anybody else see, does anybody else want to offer maybe a potential? It could be described as both maybe an opportunity, but also an obstacle, depending on you know how how it played out with the idea of having these originate with you know HUD or versus the Department of Education. If they're attempting comprehensive approach and systems change. Does anybody want to take a guess? I mean, think about it from this perspective. If systems change in many ways is trying, and, and it's and if a CCI is meant to be comprehensive, it's in many ways trying to work across multiple different disciplines. And many of these professional practices are sort of inherently siloed in their current form, right? So if it's sitting within a department of education or HUD and the idea is to attempt change that crosses over to another sector, you can imagine at the outset that there might be some obstacles with the right kind of sort of collaboration and building the relationship between the different sectors, even at the local level, right? Like if you're, if you're funding and your, and your professionalism has been housed in HUD and you're trying to also address school issues, you could imagine that that's going to present a complexity and vice versa. If you're trying to address schooling issues, but you understand there's a relationship between educational outcomes and for example, built environment and housing quality and economic opportunity, you may however not necessarily have, you know, the relationships in place and so on if you're coming out of the Department of Education. So you could see potentially there's obstacles there, but then simultaneously, because these two programs were put in place at the same time, there were opportunities because in another sense, it also created multiple funding streams for very similar work in the sense that they were funding opportunities to create local planning and implementation efforts. So the same sort of neighborhoods or locations or, you know, within cities could apply for both process, you know, grant funding for both processes and work together collaboratively and build off of that and have more resources to try to address or craft solutions, right? To address issues and create solutions. So sort of like a both, you know, obstacle opportunity. But though that's one way you could describe a CCI, right? It comes from the resources come from the federal government as well as other, maybe they're pooling other resources, but the idea is it's a grant making opportunity where local communities apply for these planning and implementation grants and they may operate at a very small geographic scale, but it's open to everybody across the country. And there's clear and obvious public sector support and involvement. Another example that's at a different geographic scale and has like sort of, you know, it has a very different sort of funding stream is something like the Building Healthy Communities strategy, which was statewide in California. That's an example of a, you know, a CCI that is smaller in scale than the others in the sense that it's you know it's we're talking about a smaller um geographic location that applies for the funding it involved one billion dollars being invested into 14 communities across the state of california exclusively and the idea was to invest in these these 14 communities over a 10-year period to address chronic disinvestment in poor conditions that the California Endowment recognized had deep relationship to health outcomes within those 14 communities. So this is a different way to approach this. In this context, it's not that the public sector isn't involved, right? If you were to look carefully at that approach, you would see that there were some elements of you know, very clearly defined engagement with the public sector, but you can see this is not a federally sponsored program, right? It's coming, it's emerging from a foundation. And then another sort of example of how these can work at a different geographic scale is the New Communities Program, which was an example of $50 being 
um, used for a place-based strategy in Chicago across 14 neighborhoods within that city. And this was sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation. And this work was working to address employment, health, housing, and violence reduction. So these are just sort of different examples of how CCIs can work at a small geographic scale in terms of the place-based strategy being linked to a neighborhood, but be sponsored by different kinds of entities, whether it's a foundation or the federal government. And then in that context, they can be either national scope in the sense that they could be sites that are across the country or localized to a single state or even to a single city. So, um, so let me just make sure I don't, I don't want, I don't want to skip slides. Here we go. Key conditions that researchers have defined um, as necessary to succeed. So this is, you know, the literature on CCIs has grown over the years since they've been in place since the 90s. I think one of the first ones that's really complex, of course, is be realistic in scope and commit long term. So Emilio, you made a comment about transitions in administrations, right? So that has relevance in this context because success is tied to the ability to commit over the long term. But if a CCI strategy is funded by and initiated by one administration, whether we're talking about a federal administration or a state level or any other sort of government administration, and that administration shifts, it may be that that significantly disrupts the capacity for the strategy to be committed to the long term, right? It could limit the resources in many different ways, not just financial, but the ability for the program to even continue operations. That also has relevance even when the funding and the resources and structure come from outside the government. If you have a change in leadership and you know, the direction of a foundation shifts, that can play a huge role as well as to whether or not a strategy is going to commit to the long term. I just wanted for a moment, I'm going to pick on the two public health students and just ask them to sort of weigh in for a moment and just venture a guess. Why is commitment to the long term likely very necessary to see any sort of success with these strategies? What do you think? Um, well, progress just takes a long time in general. Um, and so I think it just, I mean, that's basically how it is for all situations at all times. It just takes a long time. So you need to have this commitment and the plan needs to be strategic. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's really no, that, covers like. No, yeah, and I would, do you have any thoughts? Um, I would just add that like uh, for a lot of, at least like um, when you look at a public health kind of standpoint, there needs to be a bit of like long standing infrastructure, kind of like what Danielle was saying. And if it's not looked into like a long term implementation, um, it's too easy for like you're saying new groups to come in and kind of scale things back and then you don't actually make any progress. I was also thinking too about how do you even evaluate the next bullet point talks about creating an adaptive evaluation process. And I was thinking when you try to study outcomes, I mean, you can't necessarily test for outcomes, for example, in a 12 month period as easily, right? You, you need time, right? Mm -hmm. You need time to be able to see whether you've had change in outcomes. And then from, from my planning students, do you guys have any other thoughts as to why, you know, from the planning perspective, why having a long-term commitment might be particularly critical, particularly if you're thinking about, you know, the, the community processes. And we'll, I'll talk some more about this, but I'm just curious if any of you you know, in, in your studio work, have observed anything that about at you? Well, I think in our studios, one of the things we were trying to avoid was uh, being, quote, drive-by researchers or planners, uh, you know, just stopping by for a quick visit um, and not really contributing to the long-term either success or being invested, you know, personally, financially, or whatever in a community. Um, I think if you want to see success at any level, at any scale, you really have to at least express some interest or basic commitment to being in there for the long haul and, uh, you know, seeing how your project or initiative weathers the ups and downs of uh, time. That's absolutely right. That's, that's uh, what I was hoping to talk about briefly from the planning perspective. I think that is one of the points that comes out repeatedly in 
in discussions about what has and has not worked. You know, residents can be very exhausted by researchers and planners and other professionals coming into their neighborhoods to explore an issue and propose a solution, but not stick around, right? I mean, meeting new people all the time to dissect, study, and maybe try to support resolving the same problem can be exhausting uh, for, for residents. Another also yeah, I also wanted to mention that it does take a long time to get buy-in on the political side and on the community side, which That's is extremely important to the success of any type of program, whether that be public health or urban planning. I think that's actually absolutely right. Do you have any sort of, you know, thoughts as to why it takes so long? What do you think are some of the factors that contribute to, to why it takes so long to get buy-in? I think on the community side, especially in public health and in the government, sometimes you question if they have your best interest in mind right. and so you really need to work with the community or based organizations on the ground that have this influence and this power to kind of like coalesce together and make sure that what you want to do and what the community needs aligns and on the government side the government really or on the political side they have to make sure that what you're doing is going to get them reelected. so yeah I think I think you're you're calling out some important part point. And I was gonna say part of the reason for the complexity and challenges, if you are doing work in a neighborhood and you are not a resident of that neighborhood, just automatically you're an outsider, right? And you are not necessarily going to have the same understanding. Like you may have you may have an academic understanding of the issue that you're working to tackle, but you don't live within that circumstance. You don't live within the neighborhood. You don't have a personal connection to the space. And even if you move into the neighborhood, you know, for example, you're still in that sense sort of a newcomer to the situation. And it, it speaks really to something else that I, I'll get to in a late slide, but it's to the value and importance of local knowledge in both defining a problem as well as a strategy to create a solution, right? I mean, I think that's something we'll talk about but yeah, of developing buy-in taking a long time is, is it's very real and it, it's absolutely true that it does take quite a bit of time to develop the trust that you need to have with residents in a space for them to feel that you are invested in an outcome that they want to see occur. And then uh, some other sort of points that have come out of the relevant literature that describe necessary conditions for CCI success is this idea of an adaptive evaluation process. And that again, like I think, I think again, that starts to sound like jargon. So let me just sort of break this down into different discrete elements. I noted at the beginning of talking about systems change, that systems change is unpredictable work. You have to walk into the process recognizing it's unpredictable. That's where the term adaptive comes into play, right? You need to evaluate the process. You need to do it at multiple times. You need rigorous evaluation methods. You need to work across different groups, including with residents, to define what it is that you're looking for in terms of indicators or outcomes that you should be looking for. You need to think carefully about the methods. You need to recognize at the outset that getting the data is gonna be hard to do. But you also need to be able to adapt to constantly changing circumstances. Changing circumstances can come from changing funding sources. For example, if there are changes in allocations of resources, if there's changes in the government structure for relevant government organizations that are involved in some way, there's a whole host of reasons why the circumstances can shift. Conditions can also shift because of larger regional economic changes, for example. You know, we've seen over time that neighborhoods in the urban core that have historically been disadvantaged, you know, they can, the conditions can shift where you may have poor performing schools, you may have limited food access, you may have all of the critical issues we've described in terms of built environment, you may have issues of concentrated poverty, and all of a sudden you start to see escalating land costs. And it's a relatively recent phenomenon. That could be a significant change in the conditions. And then you need to adapt to how the strategy is going to, you know, work within that changing context. And your evaluation tools may need to then shift as well. Another factor that I think connects in with what, the, actually the next two really connect in with what Danielle was highlighting. Assessing the political context of a place and targeting places where there's political will that's aligned is also really, really important. So what that means is understanding that you need to have, you need to have uh, 
you need to recognize that you need to have some partners at the local level. They may not necessarily have, have already synced up with the approach that this strategy is working towards, but they must, there must be somebody who has the political will and enthusiasm to see the outcomes you're, you're attempting to reach, right, within the geographic space you're in. It's very difficult to do this work if you don't have a lot of different levels of community. I'm referring to residents and local political leadership and local public agency institutions involved. So for example, if you're trying to address something like poor performing schools, if you don't have buy-in and some political will from the part of the school leadership, it's going to be very difficult to make the improvements in the schools that you would like to make, right? Just like if you're trying to address something that relates to the built environment, it's going to likely implicate some kind of land use system that is probably going to have some sort of law attached to it that is very much influenced by local politics. So, so understanding whether, what the political context is of a place, whether there's already existing relationships and collaborations between entities or whether or not there's tension is important. Then seeing where there's actually political will that's aligned with the goals of the CCI is pretty fruitful in terms of determining whether or not there are conditions there to really succeed. And if, if there isn't, then there can be substantial work at the outset to try to get to that. Um, oh, so sorry, it looks like this duplicated. Um, that was an apology. Apologies, it looks like I, when I made edits, I accidentally duplicated. So I'm gonna move to the next slide, but I'll talk to you about some of the other um, elements. The other components though that are pretty important in terms of conditions for success include thinking about some of the themes that have sort of already emerged in the conversation. We mentioned, of course, that there is building the trust and making sure you're there, you know, over the long run and being realistic in scope and so on. But another component of that is also developing grassroots leadership. It's pretty important that your strategy not be top down. That's extremely difficult work. I'm just going to point this out that, you know, here all of us on this you know, in our, in our class, we're either professionals or pursuing, you know, a degree track that will lead us to becoming professionals potentially in this space. And trying to do this work in that context always sort of risks that we could implement what we might describe as a top down strategy, right? Like we take, we take this professional knowledge to a place and we say, well, this is what we think needs to work out. This is what we need to do to make this work out and we share it with local residents. But the point of developing grassroots leadership is recognizing that top-down strategies are not going to really succeed. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not actually going to implement the change or lead to the improved outcomes. In fact, what you really need to get to that long-term sort of sustainable um, success is you need to have substantial grassroots sort of organizing happening even before the initiative happens. And this, this is actually leading to sort of the idea of getting the buy-in, but also the long-term sort of sustainability in whatever it is, whatever change it is that the, the group is, is trying to work toward, right? So you have to have leaders, people, I think Danielle mentioned community-based organizations, right? You have to have local leaders that already have trust with residents, that residents are actually part of those organizations and or leaders within those organizations playing a critical role in the implementation. We have to support the organizing and development of that prior to the initiative even beginning. So that's one of the other factors. And another one that's deeply related to that, that unfortunately got cut off in my, my effort to edit these slides is creating you know an opportunity to share power through decision making that's really difficult and i'll explain more as to what some of the challenges are but committing to working to share as much power is really impossible is really important and it's part of connecting in with this idea of you know sustained long-term commitment and getting buy-in it's really difficult for residents and for members of a community to buy into a process that they can't actually shape or make decisions, you know, to see certain outcomes or certain processes that would lead to certain outcomes 
that's, it's very, very hard. Like nobody really wants to just be told what their problem is and then been told and then told how to fix it. Often people who are dealing with different kinds of complexities want to play a role in defining the challenge and understandably so. You can, you can kind of connect to your own personal experiences in terms of how you would feel if somebody were to come to you and define a problem you feel that you're experiencing without your input. So those are, you know, those are the, the different sort of key conditions for success. So in terms of the challenges that have emerged, you know, as well, and that are often discussed in, you know, current evaluations and literature around this, the fact is, is long term is long term. And it means that there's a lot of time and effort and investment that's going in. So it's monetary and time. This one that I have, the first bullet I have, the significant time and effort investment, I'm not even thinking about the foundation or the government, the public sector. Who do you think I'm thinking about here? If I'm not talking about the foundation and I'm not talking about the public sector, who might I be talking about? Um, private sector or nonprofits? Certainly there's a lot of time and effort investment but who's the most vulnerable out of all of the different stakeholders that we might be discussing? Intuitively. The community themselves. Exactly. So Danielle, for, for just sort of following up on that, thank you for volunteering and now I'm going to pick on you with a follow-up question. How would you describe a community member in terms of the, you know, their situation as compared to the professional who works for the nonprofit or the government agency personnel, the bureaucrat, or the foundation program officer? What's, each of them are gonna give time and effort, but how might the community member be differently situated in your mind? I think for the community member, if they were to be given a place at the decision-making table, that's a really different and new experience for them. They may not know kind of like the bureaucracy that you're supposed to go through. And I think a lot of times when you don't know that, you have these really big overarching ideas and oftentimes it could get like slowly knocked down so that the hope that you have sometimes gets like diminished by the end of going through the entire processes. And then on top of that, being a person of the community and with less power and with less resources, you might have other things that you need to take care of that does not prioritize like these current community initiatives. I'd like to build out that last point. Can you just sort of hypothesize for a moment the complexity of having other competing, you know, things on your time? I mean, like anybody want to sort of venture to guess the different situation you might be if you're community members. So say you're going to have regular convenings to make decisions on both, on each element of a CCI strategy. But you're going to set up those meetings during normal business hours because let's describe multiple stakeholders that are gonna be around for the, you know, for the course of that meeting. You're gonna have a bureaucrat, a government bureaucrat. You're going to have a program officer from a foundation. You're going to have a, um, let's, let's say you're going to have a community-based organization nonprofit you know, member, and maybe you're also going to have um, a political, a representative, either the political elective of the space or their representative, right? Those are four of the stakeholders. And the fifth is going to be a resident from the community. Those first four, so are calling for a meeting between 9 and 5 p.m., 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, likely because this is a part of their actual workflow, right? They're getting paid for their participation in some way or another. That resident, however, maybe they're given an opportunity to participate. Maybe this is one of the first times that they've gotten an opportunity to sit at the table and help contribute to making decisions. But they're not, they're not actually, you know, maybe the structure is not actually compensating them for their time. But more importantly, if it's scheduling it between nine and five, they may have another job, right? Or a job just a job, right? Like this is not their job. This is, this is where they live. They want to have a say so and an opportunity to participate. But if the scheduling, for example, 
requires them to commit time, they need to take that time away from some aspect of their life, right? So all of the other individuals, if they were to give time outside of their normal business hours, yes, they might be intruding into their evening, time with their families and so on, but it's very likely that with the resident, they're gonna be intruding on some other obligation no matter when the time of day is scheduled. That is, that is usually you know, the different situation, that resident participation, you know, that can create, right? So this, this comes up all the time when you're even just thinking about community engagement strategies. How can you create robust opportunities for community members to participate, recognizing all of the competing demands, competing demands on their time? Or for example, if they have children, do they have the means for childcare to participate? right? Are you constructing a space for somebody else to watch their children so they can participate? Are you creating translation opportunities for someone to participate if you're working with a community where English is not the native language, right? There's so many layers to this. And the significant time and effort investment on that bullet point is really referring to the fact that from the resident perspective, from a disadvantaged community, that time and effort investment is huge you are likely taking time away from some other essential activity and you may not be compensated for your time. And in fact, it may even cost you something to participate, right? So if it doesn't succeed, it's a really big deal. And if, if there's not a long-term sort of investment into that space, that's a really big deal. But also asking that of residents is a really big deal. So I think, um, that's another sort of component to why you know these initiatives have to invest in the grassroots leadership grassroots meaning that residents investing in residents and organizing residents and organizing with community-based organizations that are deeply involved with local residents before the initiative begins it's not just sort of thinking about making sure that the design of the initiative is the most responsive and the best possible design it's also to to sort of create that structure to have it in place where you have residents who have been able, you know, you can recognize what it is they need for them to participate and you sort of have a system in place to allow people to regularly participate. Another, another, that's, an, that's something that, that doesn't always happen and it does create obstacles for success. Another really big issue is missing out on everything I just described from the outset and throughout the initiative because you're overlooking the value of local knowledge altogether. In other words, there's always a risk when we come into this work, particularly from our professional backgrounds, that we emphasize our own technical expertise. For example, we define a problem within a neighborhood based on the reading we've done about the issue. Like, right, like maybe we've read everything there is to read about neighborhood effects, or we've read everything there is to read about the challenges of constructing affordable housing in a particular geographic region. Or maybe we have read everything about what leads to particular, you know, to childhood obesity in particular types of neighborhoods or something like that. So we come into, an, into the problem with our technical expertise, but we fail completely to talk to the local residents about how they define the problem, as well as the factors that they believe contribute to the problem. Right, and that's, that's, a, very, that's a very big problem within this work. It's e easy to overlook local knowledge. It's easy to emphasize the value of the degrees behind our names and the expertise that confers. But we have to remember that understanding a problem always begins with how we define the problem in the first place. And defining the problem is more than just defining it based on what the relevant literature says. It's very important to actually talk to residents in a space to understand what they define the problem to be. And then to also talk to them about what they see the potential solutions to be and what they think are the contributing factors. Because the fact is, it's the only way you're gonna ever get a sense of the true local context in which that broader problem is being described. Because we know this from our own reading, everything we read is qualified right by the facts of that particular case that might have been explored if it was a case study or if we were if we're looking at a cross-sectional study that's pulling a lot of data from a bunch of different places it's still qualified by the point in time that it you know that that study was conducted or if it's exploring statistical statistically significant relationships between various you know variables or something it, it's still limited by the fact that it can't fully define the causal 
relationship between one factor and another, right? So you have to go to residents just to even gather more information about the local context because they are the ones that hold that information. You probably will never find it in a book. There could be the rare circumstance where you're doing work in a geographic location that you know has been substantially written about, so you might be able to acquire a good amount of historical information and other information from those readings on that location, but it's still no guarantee, right? It's no guarantee that you'll get everything you need from reading. So super important not to overlook local knowledge, but a very common mistake. Another problem is that I think it's really easy when crafting comprehensive systems change strategies to be completely unrealistic in scope, to create a short timeline and think, you know, but we've resourced it this way, right? Like we maybe we've even funded it at a very large level, but th that's not necessarily, that's not necessarily going to lead to the improvement in outcomes. I mean, I think, I think after the reading we've completed over the past months, I think everyone in the class would agree the challenges that we've been describing and discussing in this course, they emerged over a long period of time and are the consequence of multiple elements, right? This concept of, of systems change and this idea of an integrated whole is, I'm certain, very familiar to all of you because everything we've been talking about in terms of the complexity of the challenges, breaking apart elements of an integrated whole, right? Understanding that housing, affordable housing, and poor education, and poor health outcomes, and environmental conditions, and concentrated poverty, and job opportunities are also interrelated. That's work we've been doing for months now. And I think the complexity we face in designing these place-based strategies is understanding that you're trying to tackle something that did not happen overnight, right? It's related to a system that has emerged over many, 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 many years and over multiple systems at different levels of government at different, you know, so a single place, a single neighborhood is influenced by multiple systems that sit in different kinds of, you know, parts of our society, right? There's programs and policies that are public policy and then there there are conditions that are related to the, this, that particular space and history of that space. There are elements that are in relationship to the resources available to different levels of government that may impact that space and so on. There's so many different com you know, com um, components to the challenge that creating an unrealistic scope is something that's easy to fall into and thinking you're going to you know, design a strategy over a short timeline with a lot of resources to attack all of that, very easy to fall into. But I think given the readings we've done, I would venture to guess that all of you would probably agree that a short timeline, even with a lot of money, isn't gonna be the only fix, right? It's, it's very complicated to undo some of these different things. And so we have to try to think very carefully about realistic scopes and we have to work in many ways you could stay over time with intermittent milestones and achieve goals at different levels right and constantly be working at different levels that's the concept of systems change right you have to keep working towards making shifts at the local level within the immediate geographic area while also thinking about how you could shift policy maybe at a higher level that touches and impacts that geographic space that neighborhood but in fact requires work for example at the state government level as well as the federal level, right? There's multiple strategies that have to be implemented at, at the same time. Another challenge is developing indicators. Another challenge is that people sometimes develop indicators for success, you know, for the purposes of evaluation. I mentioned how important evaluation is for success, but they develop the indicators completely without community input. That's a huge mistake. And does anybody want to sort of offer their thoughts as to why they think that might be a big mistake? Anybody want to generally, go? oh, sorry. Oh, no, great, Dana, thank you. Um, generally, if you're doing something for the community and like it goes back to you saying that defining the problem, I mean, understanding the problem would mean defining the problem and the best way to do that is to get the community's like take on the problem. So it doesn't really make sense to develop indicators to fix that community if the community isn't involved. 
Because who are you fixing it for? Like, what's the overall exactly. agenda? That's exactly right. Who are you fixing it for? Are you fixing it for the foundation? Are you fixing it for the government entity that's providing the grants? Or are you fixing it for the residents? And really, you can't really fix it for them. Any problem that you're trying to attack has to be done with them, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you have to do the work with them, and you lo in long term, you need it to be sustainable where they can continue the work, you need to define the indicators with them. That's exactly right, um, Dana. And so I think those are, those are, that's, that's an important um, issue that comes up. Another one is that, Danielle, I think you touched on this a little bit, and that is that the political context itself could be, you know, an issue. And what I mean by that is there could be a situation in which the local political context really challenges the ability for cross-sector collaboration. So for example, what if the local school leadership and the local city leadership don't get along or the local parks leadership and the local school leadership don't get along or you know if what if local cbo's are working in and have some con conflict with each other your your best work the best work in this space is going to come from collaboration and from across sectors but if there's if that local political context is sort of feeding into conflict you're going to be challenged in this work. And so if that's the case at the outset, there has to be a fair amount of work that's done before the initiative begins to try and improve relationships. Because if you don't have cross-sector collaboration, you probably won't see any success with a co comprehensive approach, right? You might be able to achieve, you know, a limited improvement in a, you know, single issue work in that kind of context, but very, very difficult to see improvements across multiple issues, given that they're so interrelated or any substantial improvement, if you actually don't have cooperation between the various groups that are responsible um, you know, for, for managing those issues. So I'm gonna move now into more recent um, approaches. This is something that really builds in many ways um, off of the same strategies it's, it's not so different. There's a little bit of a nuances to the difference, but this concept of the collective impact approach, it's a little more contemporary. Uh, it's really building off of past practices, but, and it also involves a cross sector collaboration to advance systems change. It does formally always include government as one of the collaborators, philanthropy, and businesses, but it's a little bit different in that it employs a formal framework. And what I mean by that is that it, it there's a, like there's a there's a body of literature, particularly in the practice area, that describes a disciplined framework to to employ. And this is the framework framework that uh, a collective impact a collective impact approach takes. It will involve the use of a common agenda, so that allows for something that's defined you know, between the different groups. A common agenda basically means that there's always gonna be some disagreement, you know, between parties. It's not that there won't be, but there is going to be all of the leaders agreeing on the primary goals of the collaborative initiative, right? So it's not that everybody is going to be identical in their ambitions or their, their primary goals, but they have overlap over some of their goals. And, and have recognized that and have formally recognized that. The shared measurement system means that there is data that's gonna be systematically collected and reported on a set of indicators that the parties have agreed about that can be used to constantly assess the progress and encourage learning and accountability. So I wanna sort of emphasize that this is a component that's sort of recognizing from what we just described before, how critical constant evaluation is and it's also recognizing that it has to be rigorous and it has to be a set of indicators that the, the groups agree to. In a moment though, I want you, if you're noticing a missing ingredient, I want you to keep that in your mind. I'm gonna point it out in a second. There's gonna be also the presence of mutually reinforcing activities. What that means is that different partners are gonna recognize that they play different roles in the systems change work, right? So 
their activities are going to be strategically linked to the overarching plan, that common agenda that they all agreed to, and it's determined collaboratively. But they might be working in their individual spaces to all achieve that common agenda. In some sense, you could say that that makes sense because that's how a lot of this work is done, right? You can understand that schools, for example, operate in a particular manner to influence uh, outcomes in a place, whereas a, you know a local county health agency does different work or you know the city government may manage parks and recreation like each of these entities they manage a different component of all of the different features that are going to be relevant for example for improving a neighborhood another important component is continuous communication which really refers to basically being able to support regular face-to-face -face and web-based interactions i'm putting in the web-based because we now understand like it may not be so simple to always have face-to-face -face meetings. And in, in this context is where partners are constantly building relationships with each other and trust and share a shared vocabulary. That shared vocabulary is pretty, pretty important. I would even sort of supplement that with saying, in my own observations, I think that transitioning some of that common agenda, shared measurement tools and continuous communication into, uh, for example, a memorandum of, of understanding that maybe you even routinely update. It's sort of a written document. It's not a contract, but it does offer sort of a written format in which these different parties can come together and define their, you know, their respective roles within the work and what their different responsibilities are and what their shared goals are. And they can keep coming back to that document to sort of keep you know, the momentum going is not a bad idea. I've seen that be very successful to keep things moving over time. And finally, and this is a part, this is a component of this that I think is pretty critical. There always is, has to be a backbone support system. And what that means is an actual sort of infrastructure in place, an organization that's dedicated, you know, that's dedicated staff that's really independent of each of the partners that are part of the collective impact to actually coordinate, facilitate, support, guide, and mediate this collaboration. In other words, there's somebody whose role is entirely about keeping this collaboration intact. Because if you think about the complexities that go with constant communicate, continuous communication and making sure that there's a common agenda and improving relationships and, you know, that's, it's really hard work. So dedicating resources, money and staff to that is super important. Um, another part of the existing literature has sort of described that there are actually some key conditions that are necessary to, you know, for success that actually have to happen before even implementation of a collective impact approach. And that is there has to be the presence of an influential champion. Um, what that's referring to is this idea that you have to have somebody who you know, has the kind of resources um, you would describe as, I mean, we're not just talking about financial resources in this context, right? They have, they have the ability to sort of keep momentum going. Um, and that's, that's something that people are saying is sort of a, a precondition to success. There's this idea that you have to have someone within different organizations that's going to sort of keep people enthusiastic it, you know, they're influential in keeping an organization committed or keeping a partnership in place. You certainly have to have adequate financial resources. You have to go into the work knowing it's expensive, knowing it could be more expensive than even anticipated. And at the same time, in order to sort of really have it take off, there has to be a sense of urgency for change among the party, you know, the partners. Those are some of the, the different preconditions for success that the literature has defined. Um, another important sort of two conditions that have emerged as well is this concept of having strong informal relationships, this idea that the ability to have constant communication and positive working environments is in a sense connected to the strength of informal relationships, right? So the presence of informal relationships, strong ones in particular, can do a lot to help smooth over potential conflicts that could emerge, right? So there's that, there's that factor. Um, and then I think the other one is this idea of engaging community. This is something that's also, I'm going to describe some of the things that have not worked well. And so it's, right now I'm sort of flipping it though and saying this is a pretty important condition for success. Everything I described in terms of that initial framework, none of that referenced engaging community, as you can see. 
right? I mean, it was it was describing a framework that involved leadership from different different uh, sort of partner organizations, the private sector, the government, and you know, you had also the idea of um, businesses, local businesses, and so on. But at the end of the day, just as it is true with a comprehensive community initiative, the fact is is that um, I think when you're dealing with collective impact, you have to have substantial community engagement in order for that to even work. So I think that's, that's something that's really important. And I'm going to sort of talk about it in the context right now of, of what the challenges are. I think one of the obstacles to success is that the structure itself, at least at the outset, it really describes convening established organizational leaders and decision makers. It's, it's very much overlooking the value of local knowledge. It's completely missing the importance of having residents at the table. And it's missing the value of also assessing the capacity for shared decision making with those residents. Now, more recently, in a lot of the writing, there's been a fair amount of discussion about how important it is in a collective impact strategy to have community residents at the table, to share power with them wherever possible, to think about, think critically about collective impact work, even maybe from a lens of what is distinguishable from community organizing work, and to recognize the value of organizing residents prior to the implementation of a collective impact approach, and how to integrate community voices into the process throughout uh, the, the collective impact approach. I would say that in the literature, one of the, the issues that I've observed that's a challenge is that particularly from my own practice experience, is that it's, it's also important not to just articulate a goal of sharing decision-making power. It's actually really important to do a full assessment of the actual capacity to share decision-making power. And I say that because the collective impact approach, which is different from the prior approach we described. So the prior approach, the CCI approach, I gave you four examples, two of them, definitely involved grant making that came from the federal government. So there's no question that the, the, the government was a formal partner in that sense. The other two were sponsored by foundations. And it is true that in those contexts, there can be involvement and engagement of local government. But this, the CI approach, the collective impact approach to avoid an acronym, formally includes the public sector as one of the key collaborators. When you involve the public sector as a key collaborator, a government agency, and for the issues we're just typically dealing with in the community development field, it is very often that that agency is going to be a local agency. There may be limitations on that local government entity's decision making. They may be subject to a higher level of government in terms of oversight. There also may be limitations on which components of decision making, particularly around funding allocation or land use or so on, that can be shared with community residents or even other collaborators at the table. This must be assessed at the outset or it is likely a lot of conflict will emerge between collaborators and partners for the CI approach and between those collaborators and community residents. It should always be the goal to share decision-making power with community residents as much as possible, but it must always also be assessed exactly how much power can be shared. And if that is not assessed at the outset, there's a risk that partners at the table will misrepresent what is possible and that will create more conflict than there might have been otherwise. And that's, that's, that's something I can get into a little bit more in detail. The strengths of these two approaches, though, broadly speaking, is that, you know, these are not single issue efforts, right? We've been just discussing over the course of the semester the complexity of challenges that emerge in the field of community development and that they are related to systems, right? So th these elements are very difficult to sort of tease out in isolation. You can't correct, for example, the issue of schools and think that you will resolve all issues for a neighborhood if other issues around housing, environmental conditions, air quality, or other pollutants, violence, 
economic opportunity are not also resolved, right? Everything is intertwined and, and interrelated. So it's, it's great that these strategies employ a comprehensive approach. It's also really good that they prioritize collaboration. They, they're aiming for systems change, which necessitates collaboration, necessitates that professionals break out of their silos, right? That we don't just work in our individual spaces and instead, you know, move between fields and understand what other people do and understand how our work relates to another discipline and learn something about that other discipline and vice versa. It's also really good that they are increasingly aiming to collaborate directly with community residents. Um, and those are all positives of both approaches. Also really important is that they're adaptive, right? I think at the outset I described systems change work. If you're a planning professional or in the case of a public health professional who wants to work at the community level, I would describe you know, public policy, planning, public health professionals that work in these spaces is very much all sort of in this community development practice. The fact is, is that you need to be adaptive, right? And to again, define that term and not just use jargon, what that means is be prepared for the fact that the challenge will be unpredictable. The solutions will not be obvious. Even all of the obstacles that will emerge may not be obvious to you at the outset. That, however, does not mean they won't be obvious to residents, which again, speaks to why you wanna prioritize early community and ongoing community engagement because local residents are going to know so much, right? They're gonna be important partners um, in the process. But the persistent challenges, of course, that exist within this work is that the relationship building component between these collaborators and with the community takes long-term investment. And as earlier in the discussion, Emilio pointed out, you know, there could be a change in administration. And Danielle talked a little bit about some of the challenges with trying to get buy-in. It takes so much time. And there's, you know, she mentioned different groups, like there's resident perspectives versus political electeds. Dana, you called out some of the complexities of, of what it means to not, you know, that we were not just doing work for a group, but it's important that they participate in designing a solution and contributing to indicators. All of these things require a long-term investment. That means you need to have resources in terms of people, money, and time. It means that any sort of initiative and strategy is something that can't be embarked upon without thinking about a long period of time. And that's, that's a challenge sometimes even for philanthropy. You know, it's not necessarily easy to craft funding and resources for a 10 year or more investment into a place. And particularly if you have funders that want to see certain outcomes, you know, so then designing metrics that are both rigorous, but also providing intermittent evaluations is complicated work. Another, you know, element of this that's hard is I just described it from the professional sector but long-term investment on the part of residents is also really difficult. They need to live their lives. They need to go to work and go to school. They need to take care of their children. They need to get food. They need to do what they need to do. Asking them to stay committed to an, you know, implementing a strategy that's going to take time is hard work as well. You know, it's like, it's one thing to give up a couple hours you know, for a couple months from work to participate in decision making. It's another thing to do it regularly year in, year out for, for a decade. Another uh, part that, of this work that can be very, very challenging is both initiating community engagement at the right time. It's not uncommon that many of these strategies initiate community engagement way too late. That is one of the most common mistakes, is that community engagement follows the design of the initiative and the initial implementation. It needs to precede the design of the initiative and the implementation. That's extremely hard. Think about it from your own sort of professional expertise that you've gained up until this point. From your own perspective, why do you think it could be really hard to initiate community engagement before you even implement a strategy, practically speaking? Anybody want to volunteer guess? I want to say that like it would be hard or not hard, but the community wouldn't really know how this is going to turn out to help them in the future in the long run. So it's kind of hard to gain that type of trust. Yeah. 
So I would agree with that. And I would sort of add to it, it might even be hard for you to describe what yeah. you're going to be working on in a space if you're engaging people before the implementation, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have a forming notion, a forming idea, but the point of early engagement prior to implementation is to inform the strategy. So you have to think carefully about how you engage community in a way where it says, here's something for me to talk about with you, but I actually want your input. This is not final. This is not a final form, right? Like that's a delicate thing to balance. I think each of you in your own studies, you know, even where you're at with your own studies could imagine how challenging it is to, to juggle that, right? Like to, to just, um, to have this balancing between, oh, you know, I have, I have an emerging idea. I would like your input on it. But I do have something to actually present to you, right? I mean, I think um, it's, it's not easy to do as a professional. It's much easier to engage somebody. Actually, I'll put it this way. It is easier as a professional to inform community about what it is you're doing than to engage community about what you're doing, right? It's really easy to disseminate information. I mean, it's not necessarily easy to come up with all the different communication strategies. I think, for example, we can recognize that we have to think about translation and format and so on, but that's, that's one body of work. What I'm talking about is actually the substance of the communication, not the communication channel, but actually thinking about how you open up dialogue in a way to allow for meaningful input to come back in. Very difficult to do at the early stages and yet super critical. So it presents a persistent challenge. Another component to this is understanding the idea that you actually have to engage multiple levels of community at the outset. What do you think I mean by multiple levels of community? Uh, so probably not just, uh, you know, community leaders and, you know, obvious stakeholders, but also, um, you know, just ordinary residents uh, might take the form of going door to door or uh, kind of uh, engaging with folks at a, at a meeting of some sort. That's right. And here's the thing, you can flip it and you can also say not just residents, but also local leaders, right? Like sometimes people are really good at, at engaging local leaders, but miss residents. Sometimes, pe sometimes people work really well at engaging community-based organizations and residents, but do a horrible job of engaging political leadership. Or sometimes they engage some political leadership, but don't anticipate that other political leadership will have some say-so over a particular component of the strategy. It's therefore important to just be as inclusive as possible. Anyone who touches the space, the geographic space that you're working on, anyone who has any relationship to that place is worth engaging because you can't even fully anticipate the issues or the conflicts that might emerge, right? You can't assume, oh, well, that political leader over there has no jurisdiction over the issues we're gonna tackle. You don't know that at the outset because as I've mentioned, multiple times when you're dealing with systems work and you're dealing with a comprehensive approach, you're dealing with unpredictability. You don't know at the beginning all of the various obstacles that will emerge. You don't even know who all the players will be in terms of the most dominant voices that need to be you know, engaged, who, who has sort of say so over a particular issue. You don't know who you're gonna need cooperation from in order to see a successful strategy Im implementation, right? You, you can't know that at the outset. You don't even fully know how to define the problem at the outset until you've engaged all these different stakeholders. And the fact is they all hold their different perspective. And within the, each of those perspectives lies, you know, some truth to what will influence the outcomes. You know, it's not, it's not that, one group is necessarily white, right, and one group is necessarily completely incorrect. It's often that you have multiple people that are touching a particular place and they're going to see the issue from different perspectives and you have to gather all of them to try to craft and define an issue. You also have to recognize that you have to engage and sustain that engagement of different levels of community with the full recognition of existing power dynamics and work to try to address the power dynamics. What do you think I mean by that? How could different stakeholders be differently empowered? Anybody want to venture a guess? Um, would it just be like even 
the makeup of the stakeholder group or like kind of the resources that they have available to them, I think would kind of like stratify them differently and how much power they would have. Absolutely. And their, their formal or informal relationship to the issue, but absolutely resources. So even if, for example, within a single stakeholder group, Tori, could you imagine that different residents might be differently empowered? And if so, could you venture a hypothetical where you could see different residents being differently empowered in the process? Um, well, I think like it depends on the type of like community that you're looking at. Like I think um, it depends on the like residential makeup and if there's like um, maybe not necessarily like a, a very good mix, but like if there are people of different socioeconomic levels, you might have people who um, have to work multiple jobs so they can't come and take time to join in this like stakeholder group, whereas you have people who are like, I don't know, like stay at home moms or something who are able to kind of come out and talk for what they want. And it kind of uh, makes a power imbalance within the stakeholder group of a community, possibly. Absolutely. And I'm just going to sort of describe this within, it's, it's sort of a universal truth in the land use context, for example, uh, in the United States, that you will find that people who can participate in public processes around important decisions for land use are often retired, white, and male homeowners. Mm -hmm right? They're differently situated than maybe, and this is, this could be at a city level, right? Or a political district level as well, but in particular at a city level, the, there are different groups that are differently empowered. But even at a neighborhood level, I think, Tori, you're speaking to it, even, even in a context of a single neighborhood, and maybe the process isn't a formal public process like a land use hearing, what I just you know, referenced, maybe we're still just talking about a neighborhood that is where, where, Unfortunately, you know, there's concentrated poverty and high joblessness, but you're still differently situated if you are retired, right, versus mm -hmm. somebody who ha has a young child and you're working two jobs. One mm -hmm. person has more time than the other to participate in a process, has more time than the other to make sure their voice is heard. You're also differently empowered if one person is a native English speaker. So you could have a community, a, a neighborhood, right, where you have multiple ethnic groups, multiple racial groups, and they are all maybe similarly situated in terms of their economic situation, right? They could be defined as one group if you were looking at them in terms of rate of poverty, but as distinct groups in terms of relationship to process with respect to language access or immigration status, right? That places people in different, in different you know, categories in terms of power dynamics. Which group feels most empowered to contribute information and or participate in a process. And when you're thinking about initiating and sustaining community engagement at multiple levels of community, you must constantly be thinking about power dynamics and how to reach groups that are vulnerable and vulnerable in different ways or less empowered under our current sort of systems, right? How do we increase language access? How do we hold community engagement events at times of the day that will reach populations that have to work during these hours. And you have to think about that creatively. Sometimes people work swing shifts, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. they work during the day. You have to create different opportunities for engagement. Mm -hmm. You have to create childcare opportunities. Mm -hmm. Also, you may need to make sure you're providing food, right? There's so many different things. And it's not just about trying to create an opportunity for a space to be desirable for somebody to come to, but actually thinking about essential services that are necessary in order for community residents to even be able to participate, right? These are, these are important components of community engagement. And you're definitely thinking beyond traditional practices that are associated with public processes. And just to kind of call out one of the... That was, uh, I, I apologize for that interruption. Um, I, I think it's really important to sort of recognize this is an indistinguishing characteristic of why public processes sometimes fail. Public processes can very often focus on transparency, but not necessarily focus on improving participation and actually making sure people have access. 
And that's, that's the distinction between community development work that focuses on engagement. Engagement is more than transparency around the initiative that you're implementing. It's meant to try and incorporate voices into the process. So, I'm sorry about that. I actually thought I, I did a, a, a block caller. It's a kindergartner that's constantly calling my son. And I blocked his number, but apparently it's not working on my other systems and I'm going to keep declining, but that is really frustrating. Um, so persistent challenges that we also see is that we are dealing with a necessity of substantial and long-term financial investment. So I just described challenges that will exist for various stakeholders, but at the end of the day, you're going to need the public sector and philanthropy and other partners, whether it's the private sector, to commit money right to the process of community you know development in these spaces that usually involves costs that grow i think that in my own practice i've observed that people start out with one budget and what ends up happening is that there there is constantly a growing unpredictable budget that's often very difficult it's certainly difficult for the public sector as you can imagine and sometimes can be difficult even for the foundations. I'm going to just now move to the, I have a couple sort of takeaway slides for you. So these are not exhaustive at all, but sort of connecting in with the readings that exist on these spaces, but also sort of thinking about my own practice experience in this area, I wanted to just share with you some sort of practical takeaways, right? So all of you are like i said you're all sort of studying different material and on a track to towards a professional practice that may or may not involve community development planning but in the event that this is the direction you wanted to go into or if you're going to do work that in some ways connects in with community development planning i thought i should give you a few essential takeaways that i think are probably the most important in my mind and the first one and i think you've heard me sort of emphasize this over and over again is prioritizing work to understand the local context at the outset. Recognizing that local knowledge is critical. It is critical to understanding the problem. It is critical to designing an intervention. It is critical to implementing any kind of evaluation tool. It is critical to even understanding how to collect data. I mean, there's so many layers to why local knowledge is important. You, you have to recognize, and I mentioned this before, you have to recognize that your degree, even as important as it is in all of the materials you've read up into the point of walking into a space, it confers some information, but it is completely insufficient. It is not by itself enough to understand how the problem that you're trying to address within that local context will operate. So for example, you may have read a ton, as I mentioned before, I may have read a ton about the impacts, the adverse outcomes associated with racial residential segregation and low performing schools. And I may even be working in a space that I have some sort of personal relationship to, but if I have not lived within that particular neighborhood, if I have not spent time in that particular neighborhood, I can't possibly begin to speak to the complexity of the challenge that I'm trying to address. If I am not of the group that I am working to serve, Again, you have to come in with a certain amount of humility, understanding that technical expertise is just that. It's technical. It's built off of a body of knowledge that in some, time, you know, in some ways is an abstraction because it's, it's coming out of a professional space, whereas for a resident, it is a lived experience that is nuanced by their day-to-day -day lives, right? Like you have to understand it from their perspective as much as possible, which means you have to prioritize listening to them, engaging them at the outset, working with them to define terms within the perspective that they hold. You need to incorporate them from the outset. And again, I have to emphasize long before an initiative begins, you also have to keep striving to incorporate them as partners in decision-making, sometimes recognizing that there will be limitations to how you can do that. Particularly, I want to say, if you're pursuing a collective impact approach, which I think has a tremendous number of strengths. I think it's also valuable that the public sector is a formal partner. You must directly recognize the limitations of where any partner can act, including residents, can share in decision-making decision at the outset. You need, to, you need to speak about that openly. You need to be upfront about the limitations and then look for creative ways.
to incorporate um, residents. And that's, and there, there are ways to do that. And I, this is actually kind of leading into the next one. When we talk about community engagement, we are often, I think, thinking about what can the program officers and the foundation or the community-based organization professionals or the bureaucrats that are working for a government agency do to engage community members. And I gave you a few moments ago, a few minutes ago, an example when I was talking about different power structures, I was talking about a formal land use process briefly as an example. And I mentioned that more often than not, you have white retired, you know, retired white males, right, that can participate. Or you have people that are retired generally who can participate or homeowners who might be able to participate. What I, what I want to mention here is that there is value to improving processes generally. Process can be as important as an outcome in a particular place. There could be a long history in a neighborhood of being completely excluded, both formally and informally, from all past public processes that led to the adverse, for example, environmental health conditions that attach to a particular neighborhood, or have led to a concentration of, you know, what we call uh, less desirable land uses in close proximity to where, in the, you know, those residents live, or that have led to a lack of resources being dedicated to a particular school in that neighborhood or other elements of the built environment that are extremely important for children and families to thrive. And reforming process is work in and of itself. And what I mean by process is I'm talking now about public processes. There are ways that public processes can be substantially improved to move past just notice and information or transparency around important public decisions and can be improved to shift power dynamics to be more inclusive. For example, moving away from just having your, you know, required noticed agenda and put up online, for example, but moving meeting times to where they are, you know, going to be broadly accessible, having translation services in, you know, um, in place, maybe even creating a space where one meeting is at a more accessible date and time for the majority of the residents in a particular location, so on. But all of that, I just, just threw out just random ideas. Fundamentally, it's best if the processes, if the reform in the public process can, can be co-constructed with the residents as much as possible, because they will know what the best time and place you know might be for ex accessing a public hearing they will know whether or not posting minutes exclusively on the internet is sufficient access for that population for example in past work that i did there was a growing yemeni population in a particular neighborhood and the residents said the best way to reach would be just do some fundamental translation and then make sure that you have somebody who can go to the school sites to reach the families and verbally share the information or send telephone recorded messages about the information in terms of a date and time for a hearing. But the point is, the ideas, they came from the neighborhood itself because they had had a practice and an experience of engaging with this new and important growing population group within the neighborhood and knew what worked and what didn't work, right, in terms of reaching them. The point is, is you want residents to help co-construct those processes. And that can be really an important outcome in and of itself is improving public processes to make them more accessible so that the neighborhood can be more directly involved in all of the important local public decisions that impact the place in which they lived. And, and that itself is actually a lot of work. It takes a lot of resources. And I can tell you, it's not uncommon that in places where you're doing this work, the local public agency that may even be responsible for these processes may not be very, financially resourced. And that's where, you know, the other partners, business and philanthropy and the nonprofits have to think creatively about the resources that are going to be needed to invest in improving public processes in order to help address some of the power dynamics. Another component of this that I think is extremely important to emphasize again, there must be rigorous evaluation. How do we even know any of these strategies that I just described work? How do we know? We don't know unless there's evaluation at multiple points in the implementation 
of the strategy. And it's also important that it's rigorous and that it actually recognizes at the outset, it is very difficult to collect the data at a community level. You have to be prepared for the data collection challenges and come up with different ways of understanding how to collect that data. That often has to involve working with residents in terms of collecting data. So creating, for example, the indicators isn't something you just partner with residents around. You actually sometimes need to think about the strategies in which you're going to actually collect the data itself. You know, I think um, you can look, for example, to if you want to, if this was something of interest to you and you want to have a better understanding of it, you could go, for example, to like the Boston Foundation and look at their community index and look at examples of some of the work done there to understand um, the impact of, of different implementation strategies. But the point is you must, 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 must have rigorous evaluation and it must be conducted at multiple intervals in the implementation because at the outset of all of this, I described a challenge that is unpredictable. So if it's unpredictable and it's complex, that means you need to be able to, uh, you need to be able to measure it at different points in time to understand how you need to adapt and change and maybe shift directions and be responsive. This is also an area where you could construct your evaluation in a way that, that has elements of what we call participatory research. Does anybody want to describe, anybody who's familiar with participatory research want to describe what that means? Anybody willing to? Is anybody willing to offer? Is it um, I feel like I've heard the term once, but it's kind of jargon, like, but it connects with a lot of the things that we've discussed, some of which you've yeah. definitely described, Dana. So go ahead and mm -hmm. offer an intuitive. I response. think it's about like doing research on participation. It's a little different. It's more connected to what you said before about when you're when you include residents in identifying a problem constructing a solution, you're actually also including them in designing the research. So for example, you it's not that, by the way, I just wanna be very clear, participatory research doesn't mean the work isn't empirical. It doesn't mean you're not rigorous. It doesn't mean you're not designing a method that meets expectations in terms of maybe the research or academic community. What it means is that you are connecting with residents to define the problem you're going to study, to think critically about what data points you might want to collect and maybe working with residents to collect that data. And that's particularly important if you, if you want to have access to some data points that you can't get through, for example, an existing administrative data set, right? Because if you're trying to get neighborhood level data, that's very hard to do. If you're trying to get access to a robust sort of qualitative data set or constructing a robust qualitative data set, very hard to do. Like if you want to do interviews, getting access to vulnerable residents, communicating with them in their language. I mean, you know, some, re some people who are in this practice have, have the gift of multiple languages and can directly communicate with residents across different languages, but if you're working in a space with a diverse population, you may not necessarily speak all of the different languages of the different groups. But if you're working with residents who are great intermediaries, that can be very helpful. There's a lot of different ways in which participatory research can engage residents um, that informs all elements of it. But the, probably the most important component of it is that you're not you're not defining the research problem that you're going to study or you're not describing the hypothesis in terms that are an abstraction for the residents. Everything is meant to connect with the concerns of the residents themselves. I see somebody has raised their hand, but they're muted. I, I, I don't, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? I think it's Francesco. Uh, yeah, uh, with the moment. I can hear yeah. you. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, we don't know each other. I'm teaching in the UP studio with Webbing. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd just like to share my experience because I work in informal settlement in Manila. I found oh. your lectures really inspiring because I'm, I mean, I have challenged, as you described, 
And just, just to uh, show an example of participatory uh, research is because when we went to this community in Manila, uh, actually Baseco is one of the biggest informal settlement there, there's no any data available. So for example, we tried to design um, a floating map of the district and we asked, let's say the community and uh, the NGO to show exactly where are the place where they're floating. So we went with them and we just mapped on a, on a piece of paper and we translate this on a map that my student did for a workshop, of a summer workshop. So I think this is a kind of participatory process that I think is, um, it's just fit what you say, no? Yes, I agree. And, 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 it's, and I think you're describing how it's critical to the work. Yeah. It's exactly. essential. Yeah, and then one more thing is that because we used to work in the district since two years and a way, a strategy to initiate the engage, the, an engagement process, I use my academic research and my teaching classes. So we went to the students and we collect no, local knowledge. So I think as a first step with the academia, it's easily to enter and to know the community a little bit better. So we are realized maps, drawings, uh, you know, we went to interview the community and step by step you gain confidence. And, you know, we went last year, so let's say the first workshop was focused on mapping and analysis. Mm -hmm. The second year, we gained knowledge and confidence and we built prototypes for the community, small prototype, right. micro interventions. And after that, they asked us to have a more comprehensive work. And I think sometimes you need time because the, let's say the local government was not involved before. Mm -hmm. But then with our works, something is going on. So we are delineating an upgrading process uh, step by step. So right. I just say, appreciate your class and enjoy a lot. Well, I appreciate two points I think you just highlighted that we've been emphasizing through the duration of this discussion, the necessity for long-term commitment to a space and the relationship between investing long-term and building trust within a place with the residents, but you're also describing not just the residents as a critical stakeholder. I think you're connecting with the point, Danielle, that you made earlier, which is you may not at the outset even have the trust of the local political electeds, right? You have to, you have to develop relationships with multiple stakeholders within a place to achieve success. And that comes with time and it comes with people seeing your commitment to a place. And I think it also connects in Amelia with what you described, you know, no one really wants to see drive by research like they, they get exhausted by it. So when you return to a place year after year, it does a lot to build goodwill. And so I think um, that's thank you for highlighting the work you've done in your own studio. Thank you so much. Now, you know, the next step we are doing now, we ask because we cannot go there this summer. So we asked the um, leader of the community to provide us um, names of the family that want to improve this, their housing. So basically we will receive plot sites and the house condition now. I will ask my students to create construction drawings and to, to create, let's say, upgrading the house of the community. Mm -hmm. Of course, they will do by their own, but we will provide a sort of uh, expertise Mm -hmm. that they can use or not. But I think it's a kind of uh, online engagement process. I don't know how is the outcome, but we will check and I will let you know in case. How is yeah, I mean, we're kind of in a new space now because I do think that historically a lot of the best practices out of community engagement definitely were in the face-to-face -face context. I think that's even true for building very effective collaborations across multiple sectors within a collective impact approach or even a CCI, a comprehensive community initiative. And now that we are in a place right now where we need to move almost all communication, if not all communication to an online format or a telephone call and so on or email, that challenges the practice, right? And so we have to see what kind of new innovations and strategies can emerge from this to help build, still build relationships, maintain them, to foster trust, to increase, to continue to work towards increasing inclusivity. I mean, it's, it's historically in my own practice, I found that reaching certain groups required 
face-to-face -face efforts, even if I was approaching them without language skills, even if I was partnered with somebody who had the language skills that was still far more effective than any other method, right? And so I, I wonder, you know, with what we're dealing with right now, how that's going to influence this work. And that's a question I can't even fully answer. Um, you know, we're all sort of, we're all grappling with that. And it will, I think will will come from this, right? With, uh, with absolutely some, some uh, I guess you could say, new learning. Yeah. I got, I think there might've been, um, I got like some kind of notice on this, maybe even, uh, I'm not, I just, I had a one more, it's a chat maybe that somebody, oh, Tori. Oh, sorry. Yes, Tori, we can connect after class, no problem. Um, sorry, Tori, I didn't mean to. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm navigating the different elements of this system. No worries. <laughs> also, we, we have a few more minutes, and this is sort of the section of the course where I just really wanted to open it up to any additional questions that might be lingering for anybody or, or comments or thoughts about any comp you know, elements of this, including the other um, the guest uh, that's not in the class, if you had any thoughts or questions that you wanted to ask. I see everyone is muted. So I will take that as, as an indication that, that no one has any questions. So I would, I'll just offer a summary then, uh, again, in these last 10 minutes of what I think we want to sort of walk away from this material with, which is, I think it's just very important um, to understand that we have, we we have a you know the complexity already that existed in this space of everything we're talking about that we've been talking about through the course of the semester is the complex complex challenges that we face in terms of social problems of persistent concentrated poverty inequitable health and life outcomes that are tethered to multiple elements including the ones you know what kind of housing do they have access to what kind of transit do they have access to what is the built environment? What are the environmental health components of the built environment? What are the educational and employment opportunities available to them? Is there even sufficient, sufficient training to allow for economic mobility? Is it in proximity to where they live? Is there violence in the area? What is the food access like? All of those are interrelated pieces, right? They, they, are, they create a, a complex whole, and then they are influenced, of course, by other larger conditions and social inequities, the history of a place, discrimination that exists today, but is, you know, historical discrimination, structural racism, we've talked a lot about in the course, all of these things are, are very, very significant. And we've talked about the complexity in this, in this class of issues around immigration, and particularly in the United States, and the different legal statuses that populations may have, and how that influences outcomes and access to even some of the different opportunities to try to correct for all of the different you know elements that we just described uh, and there's a there's something very inviting and positive about trying to design a comprehensive approach that attempts systems change that acknowledges these interactive you know these pieces that interact with each other that they are elements of an integrated whole but with that comes tremendous work right it's it's not a simple task it's something that any practitioner that wants to enter into it must enter into it with a measure of humility no matter what their training or their experience even if they've had decades of experience you have to enter the work with humility because each time you enter it into any local context it is a new local context it could be there could be consistency across issues in these different places but these local contexts are still going to offer some unique aspects and that's why again i'll emphasize probably you know that one of the most important things at the outset is the engagement work because you need to learn from the community you're trying to work within and then you need to develop ways and tools in order to evaluate the success of the work you're doing over time, recognizing that you can't just, for example, implement a strategy to address or to aim for systems change and then come back in a decade later and think you can evaluate it then and see you know, what types of improvements or outcomes. You have to measure it at different milestones because you will have to adapt and shift with changing conditions. And those changing conditions can come from so many different places.
So, you know, they can come from changes in resources, change in political governance. They can come from, you know, change in market conditions, economic, regional economic um, conditions. There's so many variables. Neighborhood change can occur not necessarily just because of gentrification. You can have an influx of different populations into a space that changes the conditions. That's very true in some of the communities I've worked in where maybe it was once historically only African American, but now the community is both African American, Latinx, and has, you know, other, other like I, I was mentioning one community that also has like a growing Yemeni population. They all have very different experiences within that same geographic place. And they interact with the institutions that serve that place in different ways. And one group has native English speaking skills and the other two do not. And then you have to ask important questions about how you're going to grapple with all that and how you're gonna reach all those different stakeholders when you're designing your engagement strategies and how you incorporate their needs and their concerns and their voices into process, how you build relationships, how you can help foster relationships between the institutions. And I think um, the other, you know, sort of driver again is this one here. I just, this, this to me, I think it is really hard sometimes to, to see as you do the evaluation over time, you may not see, for example, some of the outcomes you're hoping for a long term emerge at different inter intervals and milestones in the way you would like. I mean, you're going to, ideally you're designing them with residents and residents will tell you what they would see as, as change that they're hoping to see. But I think you can also prioritize important work around shifting processes and co-constructing formal processes with residents as much as possible to shift the system in that way. You, in that sense, you're actually doing work at a local level to change policy and implementation of policy by changing public processes. And that, that in and of itself, it's something you can do in the short term that can have meaningful impact and help make incremental change over the long term because you can help incorporate important voices into processes that have been you know, historically excluded or marginalized. And that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty important work. So those are all of the points that I have to share today. And I, I wanna just thank you all for you know, joining and for the couple of guests. I appreciate your, um, your participation in our class today and I appreciate the additional, um, Francisco, I appreciate the different, the different insight you provided from an international context. It's very helpful. And then just sort of going forward, um, next week for the students in the class, we are going to absolutely be covering the materials that I put in the folder. We'll be returning to sort of the people versus place discussion and talking about these strategies and, and that same with some of the same strategies we've talked today, but in the context of those writings and um, you know, moving forward the material and you should, if you have questions about your paper projects, you can reach out to me and we can set up a separate time.